That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish that. Seriously? Don't. Don't. Oh, my God. That's bad. 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 You probably should find a job. You ever learn how to spell? Stop. Stop. Quit while you're in the middle. Don't Don't bother me. I've seen better people. Do you really want to shoot? And grow my third grade. Give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode 26 of Horrible Writing. This is Paul Sadie, I am your host, and we are continuing on with our author interview series, where we talk about these life skills, these life challenges, these soft skills that help established writers continue on with their craft when life throws things at them. Just like you, just like me, they're real human beings with real challenges and real issues to deal with, but yet they're out there telling their stories and sharing their art and their craft with the world. I'm honored today to have Kay Kenyon on. Kay has, is an author of over a dozen different science fiction and fantasy novels. I'm so excited to talk to her about these, these works because, as you know, I am a huge fantasy geek myself. Some of the works that she does or she has published are, in, include The Entire in the Rose Quartet, Maximum Ice, and The Seeds of Time. She's been nominated for a Philip K. Dick Award the Endeavor Award, and the John W. Campbell Award, and twice nominated for the American Library Association Reading List Awards. She's got a new series out. The first book is called At the Table of Wolves, but there's a second one coming out this spring, so in a couple months, that you're going to get to hear about as we work through this interview. Kay, I want to welcome you and thank you uh, for coming on to Horrible Writing. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I'm really excited to be here. I am excited to talk to you. I got to meet you, well, sort of. I got to see you. I did not have the guts to go introduce myself to you at Norwest Con in Seattle last year. Um, that's the first time I came across. I sat in on a couple of panels that you were sitting on, and uh, you mentioned a conference that you host out there in Wenatchee, Washington, called Writing on the River, or I'm sorry, Write on the River, and... Um, I also attended that and that's where we got a chance to talk. So I've already kind of picked your brain from afar and I love some of the things that you've had to say. So it's an absolute honor to have you on the show. Well, I love what you're doing. So um, this is this is great feedback to get from you. And, and Paul, I think you just contribute so much to the writing community with this podcast. And um, I just thank you for what you do. Well, thank well, you. Thank you. you had, when we were talking before uh, the show, you made a comment to me that I thought was very profound. And as someone who's centered in dealing with life, and trying to tap into that creative spirit, I, you know, I spend a lot of time on social media talking to other writers, not uh, for folks more at my level than your level, where we're at different stages in our life, but we're all relatively in the same stage of our writing lives. We've all written something, various stages of draft, whatnot, trying to get things published. And we're dealing with a lot of things that life throws at us. And I've seen a number of people in those circles of mine fall by the wayside because of life throwing curveballs at them and taking them off uh, off their publish or their, their writing goals or writing aims. When you and I were chatting, you said something, and I'd like to read it back to you and ask for your thoughts on it or, or ask you to expound on it. But to listeners, I want to share Kay's comment because, again, it was it was really profound and it really turned a light bulb on for me when I read it. We were talking and Kay said, um, the notion of our love for writing is a gateway emotion that can inadvertently lead to a sense of dependence upon writing success. So Kay, what is it that you meant when you said that? I meant that um, even, even love can lead us astray. We often like to talk about how much we love writing and we can't imagine ourselves not writing. But I think while that has a, a power to motivate us, there's a hidden danger. And it's one that I've 
actually experienced in my 20 years writing fiction, and and that is that um, we become a slave to the ups and downs of writing, and we can even uh, lose our way in our lives because of this thing that we love so much. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a complicated topic, and I'm anxious to get into it, but I, I think there is a danger in anything that we follow obsessively, mm-hmm. but there are reasons why writing is especially prone to that. And I want to talk to you more about that. No, that's I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Um, listeners, longtime listeners will know this because I've talked about it in bits and pieces in other episodes, but just to ground why and my motivation for asking you anything that I do ask you during this is because I'm a lifetime frustrated writer, somebody who was, has been a hobbyist forever and was distracted by life. Serving in the military really was disruptive to my writing. So the last couple of years I've been, now that I'm out of the military, I've been able to rededicate myself and I'm going you know, full stop, uh, just ridiculous speed and almost to the level of addiction. It's the first time in my life I've woken up at 4.58 in the morning and been excited because I know that's my writing time. And within the next 10 minutes, I'll be downstairs with a warm cup of coffee and the keyboard at my fingertips. And um, when you made that statement to me, it was almost like you were inside my head. It's one of those dangers that I've just now started to realize about myself, about how closely I'm aligning my, my, my life, my goals and my desires with what I'm accomplishing in writing. Is that something that you can identify with? Yes. It's, it's the classic, um, thing that happens to writers that, that only we can motivate ourselves. The world isn't waiting and begging us to write unless we're at you know the top <laughs> one half of one percent uh so it all depends on our intention our motivation and so we that's a a, a wonderful thing to wake up at four forty-five in the morning and go down and write because you know that's your time and this is part of what is so difficult about this topic is that that is a good thing but it is a gateway as well. And you, as long as you know where the potholes are, then you're going to be fine. So how do we balance out uh, the dedication and the focus, the f- ferocious focus in the case of, of novels? How do we balance that with not going overboard? Th- that is the question uh, that is becomes more and more profound the more years that we are writing, the more we become um, conditioned to to write and focus and produce. (laughs) So yes, I can relate to it. And I don't ever want to, I don't in this interview want to give the impression that, that the love of writing is a bad thing or a suspicious thing. It's just that it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And as long as we know that, then we will be fine. Well, actually, that's not true. I don't think it just knowing it is enough. It's, it's having a more profound sense of the danger and how it approaches us. And once we know that, then I think we need to take steps to balance out and, and deepen ourselves. And those are things that we'll get into in more <laughs> detail. But I just, I'm just saying, uh, I don't want to give the wrong impression in this interview right. that I think writing is a drug. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it can be, you know. And I, I don't know. I can't say that it's because um, it's this rediscovered love for me. I mean, I've been writing. I, my listeners know that I won a. Uh, writing contest in second grade in school and it's always been it's been there from before that but obviously even now um at this stage of my life I can still remember that that love has always been there so to, to you know it's it's like it's like rediscovering your first love again as a mature adult and still slightly being cognizant of it, it almost bordering on that um that that problematic behavior so that's why I was so thrilled when you posed this topic to me for listeners who may be struggling to to conceptualize 
what it is that you're talking about. Maybe what if if you can help me, maybe what we could do is answer for them, possibly what it would look like for them. So not necessarily talking about the the concept of this this possible imbalance, but if they were just to step back a, a, a single step in their own lives and kind of look at what's going on in their world, can you give them any indication what that would look like? What would be some of the behaviors or some of the things that they might be seeing, experiencing, feeling, or thinking that would be indicative of what you're talking about here? Sure. Um, if, if we are getting too high on the good things and too low on the problem things, if, if we're dependent on praise and fearful of criticism, if we are in a good mood when a, a fabulous review comes in and then that bad review keeps circulating through and through and through our heads when we're grocery shopping and, <laughs> and, and at three o'clock in the morning, you know, that kind of yo-yo effect means that we are giving too much, I think, giving too much credit to something that should be an avocation for us and can be a glorious one. Uh, but but it is not um, the be all and, and end all. And when we find ourselves yo-yoing, gosh, think of how that affects your life. Think of how that affects your friends and your family and your enjoyment of nature. It's just uh, recognize when you are tied to the result in the world, and that affects your mood. Now, that's saying a lot. I mean, I. <laughs> Okay, so for at the table of wolves, uh, I got a starred review in Publishers Weekly. Mm, I mean, nice. it buoyed me for days, and yes. here I'm giving this lecture on this podcast about <laughs> not being a yo-yo. But uh, you know, and then um, you're only human, Kate. You're only human. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying that's what it, that's what it feels like. It's like yes, a starred review in Publishers Weekly. I I try to center myself and say that's a good thing. It's not a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. That way you're flattening out the ups and you're protecting yourself from the downs because then there will be these bad reviews or if you haven't been reviewed yet, it's like if you're in a critique group and one of your session goes that, oh boy, that scene didn't go over at all. I don't have a clear sense of your character. And and you start thinking, oh, oh my God, I, I, you know, it's troubling to you. Uh, Instead of saying, huh, that's interesting information. So, you know, the yo-yo effect is one thing. And then just overall, uh, your life balance. Are you, uh, if you love to play golf, are you saying, I'm only going to play nine holes because I've got to get home and write? Or are you, you know, <laughs> willing to let yourself have time to pursue other interests? And this is especially a problem for people who are on contract with publishers because the pressure goes up. Before you are on contract, you have a lot of time to decide how much – I mean, you are more able, I think, to decide, well, I'll go on a two-week vacation or I'll, I'll, I'll try out this other thing I'm interested in life. But once you're on contract, you feel this incredible pressure to always be productive. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself – I think, um, what kind of pressure do I feel under today to be productive? That's, that's an indicator of whether you're tipping a little into the dark side. Okay. That's it. So what are, what do you, in, in Kay's opinion, what are some of the reasons we fall into this trap? I, I am identifying with everything that you say, what you're talking about. I can picture the me processing through those various stages of this new writing life that I have. So to help um, others, to help other listeners, to, uh, you know, aspiring writers, people who are maybe just starting to step down this path that you're talking about here, the one that I'm currently living through, what are some of the reasons that you have seen, or maybe you yourself have experienced that we do this to ourselves when our, you know, our more rational brain probably gives us plenty of warnings to stay away from it, but yet we trot on, you know, uh, against, uh, against all better judgment. Well, this is a very tricky subject and 
I don't pretend to have all the answers to why this happens, but first of all, we have an image, uh, especially before we are, have published very much, of what the writing life is like. It's creative, it's fulfilling, it's exciting, it's m meaningful. And, and yes, it is those things, but the writing life is also, it's just a, in a way, it's just a job. It's a wonderful job. It's a more creative job than most people have. But it's, it's, it's no better than throwing a pot. It's no better than being a teacher. It, it, it's better for you because that's where your skills lie. But it's not it, this fabulous, wonderful thing that will, that will, that will reinvent your life. It, it's just a path of life. And um, we forget that the writing life is going to have difficulties and our, our unrealistic image of, of what that creative life is like leads us to feel um, not only disappointed when it's not like that, but it also leads us to try harder to make it work. And, you know, like the horse in Animal Farm, I will work harder <laughs> is the answer to everything. Um, and then there's just this other thing that I think enters in, and that is that some of us are gifted with words so much. We, we love words and expressing through writing so much that we aren't terribly suited to other vocations. Uh, we, we, m many of us probably have tried other things and find, found it so empty because mm -hmm. our skills are, for whatever reason, we were born with this lopsided or, or, or greatly creative side of our, of our brains that allow us to be writers. And most of us have nurtured that a bit through high school and college. And your brain is learning, oh, this is, this is the thing I'm supposed to do. And the brain becomes more and more about writing. And so we, we feel a sense of relief when we're finally professional storytellers because we finally found our raison d'etre. Mm -hmm. uh, we finally found ourselves. And this is to some extent true, you know, but it has dangers. We, we haven't found ourselves. We found a vocation. Let's just, let's just call it by black and white. <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's, I think you, for me, I'm getting like, you know, goosebumps on my arm as you're saying that because Anybody who does write, whether we've been published or not, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, um, we know that those words that we're putting into that Microsoft Word document or that Scrivener project, they're just, you know, digital characters. But to us, there's so much more. Each character bleeds, you know, contains a little bit of our DNA in them. So the entire, the entire craft is incredibly personal and intimate, more than... I would argue almost any occupation out there. So, uh, you know, what you're saying here about these, you know, and what you said earlier about these inherent dangers and not being suited for other occupations, you know, multi-pronged here, we could survive in other occupations, but it's just not fulfilling. This is, and then you couple that with the fact that our writing really is us projecting out into the world. So how, how does... How do people, and I know this isn't necessarily fair to ask, so maybe, uh, you know, you can, you can lean on your own adaptive uh, skills, tactics, and reasoning that helped you through the process, so this isn't the be-all, end-all answer to it, but how does someone struggling with that, that the only fulfillment they get, or one of the few sources of fulfillment that they get in their waking lives is when they're sitting at that keyboard putting those, you know, putting those words to life, bringing characters and in, in settings to life, how do they build, start building that skill set or what skills do they build that help them separate something so innately intimate with that balance that has to be struck that I, I completely agree with you on all this, by the way, but it's, 
I I think that could be a definite struggle for a lot of folks because it's you know, we're not just doing a job. This is I mean I hear what you're saying about it being a job, a career. You know, it, it, it's healthier to look at it like that. But this thing is so darn intimate. What, how do we start? How do we start protecting ourselves or, or, or keeping that balance? The first thing I would say is that, um, that I love what you said about how intimate writing is, because that gets to really the heart of what I'm, I've been thinking about for the last few years. And um, what you said about how we love our characters and those come from our, I believe, our subconscious. And so they are, as you said, just a part of ourselves in ways that maybe other things that people create aren't. So when those stories don't do well or are rejected, uh, we, we feel especially burdened and hurt. And I, I think that um, when you go into writing, it's, it's good to, to be eyes wide open. You are putting your heart on the page. Ask yourself whether you can stand for your heart to be broken. And I know that sounds harsh, but I'm just saying, look, the writing industry is a raging river. Some people love the white river rapids. Do you want to be in that boat and risk a spill in the water for that joy, the exhilaration, and the excitement? Or do you want to stand on the shore and be safe? And really ask yourself that. Sit and meditate with it. Because the answer to that is not, oh, sure, I'll take some risks. You know, yeah, hey, <laughs> I'm, up, I'm up for this. But no, sit with it and be quiet. Because that's what, what will break your heart if you take it too seriously, if you allow yours, you know, you, you're going to, to extend my metaphor, <laughs> you're going to fall in the water, you know, and friends will put out their hands and pull you back in, but you will go down, you will be cold, you will be unhappy. And that's going to happen again and again. And then there's going to be the wonderful scenery and the unity with nature and the exhilaration, and then you're going to fall in the water again. So just understand this is the writing life. It's a, it's, it's not the path that most people can stand. They're not, they're not willing to live with the, uh, with the dangers of the creative mind. So uh, <laughs> having said that, um, that would be the first thing I, I would want people to just think about. It's not something you can insulate yourself from and say, well, I did my meditation and I'm in for it. I know it's going to be tough. Well, you know that, but it's, it's, it's a day to day thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's every day knowing that you can stand falling in the water, that there are friends in the boat that will help you back up. But, and, and at some point, if you can't take it and you swim to shore, there's no, there's no shame in that. <laughs> So, all right. So then you asked what else we can do. Um, boy, <laughs> Paul, I, you know, I think, I think, okay, now I'm going to get all spiritual on you. So I'm really sorry. No, you're, you're fine. Because, you know, and again, that's what I love about these author interviews on horrible writing is to have folks like yourself come on and, and just, you know, just be open with the world and, and, by extension, helping someone. Someone may not identify with what your tips, tools, and tactics are, but you know, if there's 20 people who do, you know, I try not to sound like I'm serving up platitudes, but you know, again, I I really believe that when we give of ourselves, we really enrich the world. So whatever you have to say, Kay, no matter what it is, it's going to help somebody out there, and it may be, you know, it may have a profound uh, impact on them. Well, before I get to this deeper approach, I, I just want to say, uh, um, you've talked on this show before about life balance. And uh, I think exercising every every week, uh, being a good friend, uh, a good spouse, a good, a good parent, uh, I don't know, eat broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you've said over and over again on this show, give back to the community those things help us keep in balance, but it's, uh, 
that's really the surface of things because most of us do that. And uh, sometimes it's for those of us who tend to be a little compulsive um, <laughs> or who love writing too much, it's not enough. And so um, I think that the real question is for us to know or to ask ourselves how much of our self-worth is going to be tied to writing. Mm -hmm. Take a good hard look at how much we are depending on that to make us okay in the world. Mm. That's really a tough one. And it may never go away if if we, you know, there are such wonderful accolades waiting for us and there's the sharing uh, when your book hits a little bit and you've got a lot of people loving your, your work and um, it's, we take satisfaction from that and we should, we should celebrate when good things happen. But have we forgotten completely or at least sometimes who we really are? Uh, I mean, we... In a way, I, I believe we, we are not writers or authors first. Um, I mean, let's face it, we're just beings on a journey of life. Right. And, and so writing is what we do. And it, sure, it can be full of joy and purpose, and, and that's wonderful, and we should appreciate that. But it's not who we are. Um, so this goes beyond that... Um, conventional balance idea to a deeper connection with with other people with with um with nature uh, and with something you might call your higher or deeper self mm -hmm. and how do we make that connection well that's a spiritual journey i think um in for those who don't like the term it's you know it's a it's a it's a life journey where you have to decide um where you find your intention. And if your intention is to be a successful writer, that's well, actually, that's a little superficial. Your intention should be to be a rounded, full, deep, generous, and grateful human being. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that sounds you know, like a platitude, but, but, but the, the, our society and the publishing industry doesn't help us with that. Those things aren't really valued. Th those things aren't uh, celebrated in glossy magazines and on, 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 on TV talk shows. Those are things that it's up to us to, to keep part of preferably, you know, every day uh, sitting and being quiet or, or, or feeling the your basic gratitude toward life in nature. Take a walk, be in your yard, just be in the moment. And then when it's time to be in writing, be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I, I think that um, part of the reason that we don't do these things is that we're so busy scrambling to get our pages and we're so busy scrambling to promote ourselves on social media and in, you know, signings and all, all the promotional stuff that we have to do. And it can be overwhelming because there's really no end to promotion. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm I mean, so glad you said that because as you were saying, as you were talking about that, you know, to unplug, to, to appreciate being in the moment of, you know, the, the walk on the trail behind your house kind of thing. That's exactly what I was thinking about was one of the, um, inherent dangers, maybe not obvious dangers, is the contemporary need, air quotes, the need to be plugged in all the time to do the very things that you just mentioned. So I'm so glad that you said that because um, that's, is that a struggle for you, at, even at this stage of your career? Well, especially at this stage of my career. I mean, I've, I've had 14 books published. I, I, I have to constantly battle believing that therein lies my happiness because I love to write. And um, <laughs> now I said it, darn it. <laughs> yes, you did. It's on the record. <laughs> yeah. And so it's uh, the more, the longer your career, the worse it gets. Oh, okay. It's, yes. Because you think of this, your brain has now written, my brain has now written, 14 books 
there are times when I wake up in the morning and my first thought is, she wouldn't have said that. Okay. Chapter six, line 42. No, she wouldn't have said that. It's like, oh my God, do you mean my brain has been thinking about that scene during the night? <laughs> and so, you know, and so this isn't a bad thing. I, I, I'm grateful for moments when my brain wakes up in the morning and says, chapter three needs a revision. Uh, you know, that's, that's wonderful. I have trained my brain to think in fictional terms for 20 years, and it has done my bidding faithfully. But is it happy? <laughs> you right. know, um, I must say, I, I'm not a depressive person. I am happy. But I, you know, we're trying to optimize things here. We're trying to, we're trying to uh, find a path with a flashlight through the dark forest. And, and so it helps to know where the fallen logs are. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, you know, you were mentioning um, the path behind the house. And um, one thing that I have noticed about taking walks is that um, my brain wants to think about the work in progress when I'm taking walks. Uh, and it's a wonderful, it's like, letting a dog run free. <laughs> like you're not, you're not consciously focused on it. You're looking at the, you know, the distant hills and the, the, the nearby grass and you're, you're not consciously focused, but that's the time when your brain is free to let loose. And then it will say, well, what about this plot idea? And what about that plot idea? And, and so that's a natural thing that you've been teaching your brain to do. And so it does think about that when you're just hoping to get a little exercise and get free of the book. Mm -hmm. And it does think about that at night. And so what are we going to do when we take a walk behind the house on that path? Well, I think it's a discipline, a daily discipline to say, no, let's not think about the book this time. Or, you know, maybe sometimes you take a walk just to say, I've got a plot problem. And the only way to solve it is to take a walk. That's great. That's intentional. Mm -hmm. But when every walk is about the book, then we, we need to maybe start the day differently with a different, I don't know, a different uh, ritual. Right, like, right, yeah. you, you know, you, you get up and you sit with yourself for a while or you meditate uh, or when you take a walk, you say, this walk is, is for nature. This walk is for clearing. This walk is for centering. And then noticing everything and being grateful for it as you walk. And then you train your brain to notice the beautiful things. And you train your brain that it isn't always about work. That is, I, there was so much in that answer. And I love it because you hit on the need for balance the you know the deliberate plugging in and unplugging all in that answer and and actually gave some folks some very tangible tactics tips tools and tactics that they can use one of the things <clears throat> one of the dangers and i know maybe this comes with experience so i want to ask you that as a as a follow on to what you just said because you really grounded that it sounds like and just you know you know, maybe even the test of time that you've been practicing this, reinforcing this, et cetera, over 20 years. So how does, or, or do you feel, because I have read enough from published authors, one of the tips, tools, tactics that they provide is, you know, be very wary about reading those things that throw off that balance, i.e. Uh, reader reviews. Maybe read your five stars and your four stars, but leave the rest of them there because, you know, there's nothing helpful in a one star review type of mentality. So do you feel that exposure that maybe part of this is just a, a in fairness to somebody who may be struggling with this whole thing that we're talking about here, that maybe exposure, time, deliberate practice at these things in little chunks might be the key for some folks to actually start building that skill set so they so that they can detach and that writing doesn't become too much of who they are Paul do you mean uh little chunks of writing or little chunks of uh but little uh, chunks of these practices you know whether it's it's the uh 
five minutes of meditation, they start out with that. They can't couple that with, you know, taking the walk to walk, you know, to unplug from the book. Um, so maybe only right now focusing on the meditation. So really when I say little chunks, that's kind of what I'm referring to is those help, those things that you have found or you recommend as helpful practices. If they only look at little chunks of those, because the exposure to these things over time, the aggregate is what will help them maintain a healthy balance, a healthy approach to all of this. Sure. Um, I think starting off your day with uh, some quiet time by yourself is uh, um, a way to open the path to looking at your life as bigger than writing. And then I think another small step that could help is to notice your thoughts. Stand aside from your thoughts about writing, Not not about the work in progress, but about you as a writer, your your fears. Notice when you're afraid. Notice when you're bummed out. Notice when you're anxious. Notice when you're envious. And instead of saying, well, I shouldn't be envious. They're my friend. You know, they're a big success. That's stupid. Um, sit with that. Because when you push your, <laughs> when you push the negative thoughts away, they'll just come back at you. It's like pushing a, a tennis ball under the water. <laughs> it just comes back. And so when you, the first step is notice those negative thoughts. And then if they become a little acute, go and sit and be quiet. Just go and sit and be quiet. Because that teaches your mind and your body, hey, she doesn't like this. Okay. She, she's now going to center. He's now going to be calm with himself and think and and just sit with this. Is this true? Is this something I know is going to happen? Does does her success mean that I cannot be successful? I don't have to believe everything my brain tells me. And so you've sat down. You've given yourself a little talk. You've noticed how you're feeling. Then get up and go. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. In, instead of like the the tennis ball analogy really works for me. I, I'm visualizing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. I'm so glad we had this talk because, yeah, I can, I, you know, that comparinitis is, it, it, it can be a dangerous, damaging thing. It really can. Did you say comparinitis? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Joanna <laughs> Penn, uh, her, her podcast called The Creative Pen, I listened to it, um, voraciously. That's one of the things that she talks about. And it's just, you know, again, it's one of those uh, concepts that just sticks. It, you know, it's got a great adhesive value with my brain. It just sticks with my brain, you know, but going back to that point that you said about um, having just that ugly guttural reaction to a friend's success, you know, to not, to not ignore it, to just sit down and, and reflect um, and, you know, process that being a much more healthy thing. But that's what, you know, she calls it comparinitis. And how destructive it is to the writer. <laughs> well, and and just sitting down and finding a quiet place is a discipline in and of itself because it it's saying I'm now testing a new path. Mm-hmm. I am I am not going to be a yo yo. I mean, I will be a I'll be a yo yo for the rest of my life. You know, we're not we're not looking for sainthood here, but <laughs> but but I, you know, you you're putting your brain on warning. I I'm taking a little bit different path here. I'm willing to sit with myself and and be be deeper and and look for the the truth and the centering of my life. And even if it's just asking whether that thought is 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 even valid in any way <laughs> is is a, a wake up call to your brain. Say, hey, hey, that that was just one person's opinion. Yeah, 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 and that's so and that's so healthy to think about, especially in the day and age where there's so much accessibility to writers, and there's so many platforms for everybody to have an opinion on things. Um, we, we've got to we've got to learn those skills if we don't already have them and keep them fine tuned and in practice. We've got to find those skills to kind of uh, guard ourselves from that. You know that that. So, so that we can, I guess, so I, you mentioned it when we were chatting, you know, 
in or, if we do that, if we do these healthy things for us, then we find and stay grounded with that true self versus um, losing the true self because we're distracted by all these other things and constantly yo-yoing and not taking the time to recenter and whatnot. It's a very healthy thing, way to approach this. So, Kay, each and every episode, when I have a wonderful writer on who's willing to come on and talk about these re- very real things. One of the things I try to do is get my listeners to understand because I've got listeners of all ages, all ranges, every demographic you can think of, and uh, to include writing. Some are published, some have written 30 books, and not a single one of them has seen the light of day type of listeners. One of the things I try to do with our guests is ask them to share a horrible writing experience that they themselves have lived through because I want listeners to see, other aspiring writers to see that even folks like you who've been there, you've got you've you've had your metal tested and you've come out the other side, maybe not unscathed, but you've come out the other side, you're still smiling and you're still creating. I want them to see, you know, the human behind the the novels, the human behind the writing success, and that, you know, you didn't have the road laid out for you. Uh, without the potholes, you you've bumped over some potholes in your own time. So, Kay, what is your horrible writing experience? Well, sadly, I have to say it was a novel, um, which is kind <laughs> of heartbreaking because it takes me a long time to write a novel, like about a year. I don't know why. I I write long novels. I write complicated ones, and and so, but uh, early in. In my career, I had an idea for a book about an alien invasion through the internet. And uh, I wrote it, and uh, I was under contract with a big publisher, and uh, that was uh, my second or third idea, and um, second or third book that I was working on. It had other books out. And uh, I had the experience with this novel of just falling in love with my character. And haven't we all done that? But I I was just amazed by what happened on the page. Now, uh, I'm still amazed in those experiences, but uh, this one was different because I had this idea for the uh, alien invasion when I had a dream about an alien species. And then for my major character, the second thing that happened to me is that uh, I wrote this character about a woman in a small town who was searching for her daughter. And she, this character came to me in a timed writing exercise. So because of these two things, I thought, wow, I have this authentic concept. It came in my dream and it came in timed writing when somebody gave me a starter line and I just went there and it must be meaningful. It must be, must be the thing I'm meant to write. And so I wrote it and my agent, he was doubtful about it. Uh, he thought that, uh, I had misjudged my genre because, um, it had a, a thriller concept, uh, you know, alien invasion kind of thing. Um, but I wasn't giving it kind of the major chords of a thriller because I was writing this science fiction right. uh, as a kind of an exploration of how that would happen in the world. And he was saying, well, where's the president calling out the army? Where are the headlines? Where are the newscasters frantically talking? Um, but anyway, my editor liked it well enough and the book was published and it really tanked. (laughs) I mean, it, I, I don't, I, you know, and I still don't list it in my list of novels. So I'm (laughs) kind of thankful that, that nobody ever brings it up. And, um, now don't y'all go looking for it. (laughs) I was going to (laughs) say, but, um, so this almost killed my career. And because I was on a two book contract Mm -hmm. and that was the second book. And at that point I could have er very easily been dropped. And, I did go on and came to a better concept and 
brought my agent into the discussion, you know, what do I do well? What do what what do you think, you know, would survive in the marketplace? And not that I would be slavish toward it, but just getting, you know, a little looser with I have to write this because I dreamt about it kind of thing. And um, so I went on and the next book did did very well. But there were two I guess two things I learned is one, um, don't pick your ideas green. Don't <laughs> It, don't go necessarily with your first idea because oftentimes our first idea is a cliche, even though we think it's exciting and it, it, it gets our mind all going and you think, Oh God, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But oftentimes we've, we've seen so many, so much TV that our brain is just grasping for something that'll calm the bitch, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And and so they, they go to the, your brain goes there. And my suggestion is that we just maybe want to sit with that a little bit and noodle the idea and make it deeper and then make a list of other ideas because that may not be your best one. And um, secondly, um, never kill a dog. <laughs> so true. <laughs> a, so, so in this, true. <laughs> in this, that will kill your book. <laughs> so is it, my listeners, my fans will love that you said that because uh, I, I, I told you off air uh, that I do audio drama, fictional podcasting, and my biggest show is called Subject Found. And in uh, the backstory, only the backstory, but it's it's a oh, it's no. a big it's a big foot uh, story set in in our region of the world, K, in the Pacific Northwest. But in the backstory, the the main characters passion is motivated by his childhood experience of coming across a Bigfoot and his dog gets killed. And boy, did I get some serious hate. So I learned very early on that you know exactly what you're talking about right there. Boy, you can, <laughs> you can find some enemies real quick. And Paul, not only did I kill a dog, but it was my major character is beloved Harley. Oh no. <laughs> and, and, and we, we grew to love Harley. And then after the aliens kind of started coming through and people started getting really weird and addicted. And at one point her roommate throws open the trunk of the car and my major character looks in and there's Harley. Oh, no. <laughs> Stiff as a log. <laughs> so we actually had a dead dog on stage and, um, <laughs> I probably deserved everything I got on that book. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shoot. So, uh, listeners, look at that. Look at the lessons you got from Kay's horrible writing experience. She killed a dog. Even doing that, she still rose like a phoenix and has had a wonderful writing career since then. <laughs> Kay, I, I really, genu seriously, genuinely thank you for that. Because, again, there are our, the way our brains are, in, in especially being... Most writers I know, we are our own worst critics and we can be horrendous to ourselves. And um, there's probably a hundred people for every one of you that would have lived through that and maybe gone on to become something else and not, and not pursued writing and you didn't give up. And it's, it's so awesome that you had that early on, but yet you've got this long line of success afterwards to show for that, for that dedication and that endurance and that will to keep pressing on. But I want to give, um, I want to talk about some of the stuff that you're currently doing. I mean, you've got a great back catalog, but you've got this new, well, newish series. You've got a new book coming out in the series. So can you kind of, uh, give my listeners an idea of what, the series is about maybe even going back to the first book at, at the table of wolves and then talk about what you've got coming up and maybe a little beyond that possibly. Okay. Sure. Um, right. So um, I'm, I'm writing a historical fantasy series called the dark talents novels. And uh, they're essentially uh, Nazi conspiracies and espionage. Uh, set in a, uh, a time when psych psychic powers have come into the world. And so this is set in, my novels are set in 1936 England. And uh, I, I've been fascinated by the inner war years for a long time, and it's been really fun to set these fantasies in that time period. Um, so At the Table of Wolves is a story of a, a, a woman whose name is Kim Tavistock, who, who has one of these psychic talents that uh, came into the world uh, about 
15 years earlier as a result of this tremendous suffering of World War I. And uh, she has this talent called a spill, which means that people tell her truths that they most wish to hide. And so she falls into espionage uh, as, a, as a citizen sleuth. And she uncovers um, a Nazi plot to invade England with a mysterious power over ice and cold. She's a, she's a woman who is a reluctant hero in lots of ways. She, she doesn't have any, any background. She's not a part of the intelligence service. And uh, she is not highly skilled in what she does, but she falls into it. And when she realizes that no one else is going to step forward, and it was a time of appeasement, you know, uh, before Hitler was stopped, uh, that she decide, she comes into a, a heroic stance by virtue of seeing that no one else will act. And so although it's a, in a way, it's a story of superheroes, uh, it, it's a story of, uh, of a woman finding her way to doing what must be done in a time of great, of great trials. And so um, I, I'm in love with the series. Uh, the next book is going to also be set in England, same year, and uh, it's called Serpent in the Heather, where uh, Kim becomes inducted into the Secret Intelligence Service in England, and uh, she must track down a serial killer of young people, which is part of a, a different Nazi plot this time. And... Uh, it takes place in a forbidding castle in Wales. I've even got a thunderstorm, and I knew it was, <laughs> you know, kind of a cliche, but I had to do it. <laughs> uh, but then I have her think, "Oh, great! I'm in a castle in Wales in the dark, and there's a thunderstorm." Um, <laughs> so uh, this book is; these books are coming out from Simon and Schuster uh, imprint saga, and uh, they've just picked up the third book called Nest of the Monarch, which will be set in Berlin in 1936. Oh, nice. So it, it, it's, it's going to be a trilogy then, the series? Yes. Okay, yes. All right. excellent. I, I really geek out about those when people play around with, um, uh, play in historical fiction. It's just really neat. I just really geek out about that kind of stuff. And it sounds like um, you're really jumping in on uh, some neat little uh popular tropes with you know especially with the younger crowd in audio drama so those of you who are fans of audio drama and you dig all those uh shows out there that do have characters with you know the soup with with various superpowers there's a lot of stories out there in audio drama about that this is definitely a series that sounds like it might be right up your alley to definitely check out have you uh have you been able to have some fun researching these things, Kay. Uh, you know, place. I, I've noticed um, a little bit about you. You know, I do some snooping on you, and I, I've noticed well, that you actually have done some like on location research for this these novels too. Yes, I have uh, been to England a couple of times, and um, um, I have a scene in Rival Abbey in the uh, North Yorkshire Moors that uh, uh, I almost didn't get to. It took me all day to get there, and, <laughs> uh, and they were closing the gates, and I was pleading with the oh, guy no. <laughs> saying, I have to get in, I have to get in. Well, why? It'll open tomorrow. No, I'm leaving tomorrow, <laughs> and I, I have my my climactic scene takes place in Rivo Abbey. Um, <laughs> so it was that, but he, he let me in and it was great. But um, so that yes, awesome. I've done, I've had such fun researching. And um, another thing that has been really fun for me is to talk to um, read a lot of stories and books about women spies of world war one and two, mm -hmm. because uh, those stories um, have long been hidden most uh, most people who work for the intelligence services don't write about their experiences, and um, particularly women, you know, were sworn to secrecy, and um, <clears throat> some of the things that they did were were horrific, and um, they they were genuine heroes mm -hmm. in in the world wars, and so I, I'm doing a blog series now at www.kenya.com called Women Spies of the World Wars and their their stories are are amazing and inspired me for my 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 major character. Oh neat. So this blog series is going to be based on the factual uh research that you've done 
for the character, but you're you're citing real world examples. Yes, oh, yes, that'll be fascinating. I'm gonna and listeners, I will link you to all of Kay's social media stuff, so you'll have the link in the show notes for her website. But that is something that I will definitely check out myself. I'm gonna be a little selfish right now um, because I'm fascinated by those stories because, like you said, um, history doesn't really put a spotlight on that and then the folks who the brave folks who have done that you know don't really talk about it but there are some fascinating stories about the role that women played in that period of our history so i'm going to be checking that out myself okay that is really cool i just wanted to say one more thing about about that period that um that really was the linchpin that made me so fascinated with the 30s is that it was a time when people thought they uh they they could ignore them the, the Nazi menace. Uh, and, and so the battle in the thirties had to be waged in secret. It was, it was the secret war of espionage where lots of stuff was going on, but the general public in England and in Europe didn't, you know, thought that, that they could talk their way out of war, that, that Hitler couldn't really mean what he said. And, and so, uh, this shadow war was going on, which you have these layers of deception and pretense, and um, there was there wasn't moral clarity. It wasn't. Lots of people thought that to fight against Hitler was warmongering, and so there was lots of ambiguity about it. And I love playing with that yeah. in in the book. It's not just to be righteous and to know we're right. I mean, you question yourself, and and other people are saying that you know give Germany some elbow room, and and other people were saying you know don't be militaristic. Uh, the last war took all our sons, and so mm-hmm. there there are genuine dilemmas to to be to be thought through and that i think makes for uh, a more interesting uh, adventure story when you've got all that uh those moral dilemmas that, yeah no i i agree and i love that you paint that picture of it that it's you know uh out of convenience or for simplicity's sake i don't know but you know we do have a tendency to really strip out the nuances of uh of history make it an easier narrative to digest i guess i don't know so yeah that blog series is going to be fascinating. What about some of your other works that listeners might be interested in? Is there anything that you would like to take a second to highlight? The Entire and the Rose was my uh, was a quartet that I wrote. Uh, it was kind of a sci fantasy. And uh, uh, maybe it's been my biggest success so far uh, that uh, it's about a tunnel universe that uh, burrows through our own and it's called the entire because the people that live there think it's everything <laughs> and uh, and yet uh, my major character breaks through and goes there and it's this fabulous construct of a universe and uh, it went on for four books starting with Bright of the Sky and so I I still get fan mail about it and that last came out oh 10 years ago. So that's a, that was a fun one. The entire that, does, that sounds like a, yeah, that sounds like a neat concept. <laughs> and I think my science fiction work is mostly known for its world building. So I, I had great fun with uh, tropic of creation where I was creating a world that, that biologically changes with the season drastically oh. and dangerously. And, uh, I wrote a story, uh, uh, called Rift, in which the world became was becoming uninhabitable because it was terraformed, and the terraforming got out of control. Mm-hmm. And it was became a place where an alien species loved to live, but no longer compatible, so compatible with humans. So I, I, I've enjoyed so much creating alien species uh, with, again, some ambiguity. <laughs> Never that first novel where, I, where they were really badasses and coming in through the Internet. I think I, I, think I learned my lesson there. Right. But, uh, so on my website, I have my complete, my complete list of novels. But uh, after The Entire in the Rose, I moved into fantasy because I decided that uh, well, I'd written um, – so many books in science fiction and felt the need to kind of refresh myself. Mm-hmm. And I've had great fun uh, exploring what kind of fantasy writer I was going to be. I, I wrote a, um, a fantasy novel about um, an alternate India of magic where a great bridge 
crosses an unusual ocean from England to India, uh, bridging the technological world with the magic world. Oh, and, so uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds fun, doesn't now, it? Now, did I, you I do on-site research in India for that one? <laughs> no. Oh, that would have been cool. <laughs> <too. laughs> I so wanted to. Yes. I hope to get there. <laughs> that would be so cool. Okay, so listeners, you've got a, a slew of things to check out. Kay's website, I will have everything listed there. Kay, um, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for sharing so many valuable things about returning that balance, understanding our true selves, keeping ourselves healthy so that we can keep telling these stories to the world uh, and enriching the world. I truly feel that that's what creatives do. And that's why I absolutely love celebrating creatives and having other creatives come on to to also share those lessons. I want to really thank you for your time today. And Paul, thank you for that summary of what we've been talking about. I just hit it right on the head. And I, I think it it resonates with you because you've been interviewing writers and you know what we go through. And so you really understood and helped me bring out my ideas. And I thank you for that. Well, and I, th- and I genuinely thank you because it's, it's just, it's so important. It really is. I just, my heart goes out every time I uh, read a post or I see somebody quitting on their writing dream because, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And Life isn't going to stop bombarding us, and we it, it's up to us to cope with it. And you have shared so many valuable things today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And uh, my friends, eyes wide open. It's a wonderful, glorious ride, and it is worth it. All right, listeners. Thank you for giving this another listen, another download. And thank you for spending so much time with Kay and I. I want to thank Kay Kenyon one more time for giving us so much insight and so much of her time. It was an absolute honor to speak with Kay and to have her on the show, especially so early in the show's history. So, go out, check out Kay's stuff if you haven't come across her work before. Uh, She's a wonderful part of this community and a very talented writer. You can find her at kaykenyon.com. On Twitter at K Kenyon. And you can even sign up for her newsletter over on the website so you can stay up to date on all of the updates and the releases that she has and things like book signings and appearances. Again, kkenyon.com. That's K A Y K E N Y O N. K, I want to thank you one more time for coming on. To listeners, if you're enjoying things like this, let me know. How can you let me know? Go out and rate the show on your favorite podcatcher. Give it a five-star rating and review, or at least a five-star rating. Help keep the show moving up the charts so that more writers can come across it. More writers can be helped, and we can all grow together. Until next episode, keep being epic. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less.